Um, kia ora again. My name is Alina Siegfried, um, and I'm the host of the series Our Regenerative Future, which is a partnership between Pure Advantage and Edmund Hillary Fellowship discussing regenerative agriculture in New Zealand, um, the opportunity, where it's at, um, what we can do, do to support uh, the movement. So wonderful to have you here tonight for our fourth episode in this series, where we'll be discussing uh, com the community and mental health elements of Regen Ag. And we're uh, honored to have some amazing guests with us this evening. We've got John O'Fru, Sam Lang, and Jules Matthews with us this evening. So um, coming from Quorum Sense and Integrity Soils. Um, Again, a quick reminder, if you haven't voted in that poll, it'd um, be fantastic if you can just briefly answer those three questions. So we've got a sense of who's in the room and how much um, familiarity you already have with this subject. Uh, to give you the background, uh, this topic um, started rising up for me uh, in the last few years as I've been, I used to work at the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. And I started out by thinking we were going to write some stories about some of our um, EHF fellows um, who are part of that community and involved in regenerative agriculture. Um, I ended up uh, leaving shortly afterwards, but still had a lot of interest in this topic and knew that at Pure Advantage had been looking at doing some work around soil carbon and from a, a regenerative agriculture lens. And um, with the two organizations having worked together before um, and a lot of crossovers in terms of our goals um, with um, leading innovation in New Zealand. Um, Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a global network of, of systems thinkers and, um, and global leaders working on some of the greatest challenges of our time around food, climate change, technology, uh, social equality, and any number of other um, big hairy issues. Um, and with a few farmers in the network as well. So we got chatting with a few people around the country, um, started adding a few others, the soil experts, some of the people that um, were much more clued up on the business case. Um, and what ended up was a 15 part content series called Our Regenerative Future, which you can access on uh, Pure Advantage website, which is pureadvantage.org, or the Edmund Hillary Fellowship blog, which is stories.ehf.org. Um, so that's where you can get the, the background. Um, looking at the poll, um, it looks like most people have either read some or all of the stories in that future already. Uh, that's, uh, sorry, that series already. So that's wonderful to see that there's some familiarity um, with the people that we've got on our call, um, aside from Jules, who's um, a new addition. And it looks like um, most people are somewhat or very familiar with regenerative agriculture, which is fantastic. Um, got a little under half of the people here are farmers or growers themselves, 47%. Um, big block of other. So wonderful that we're attracting people to these series that just have a general interest or, um, or in a, a broad, diverse range of industries. Um, so I'm going to get uh, cracking very soon with some questions, just a few logistics. You'll see at the bottom bar, we've got a Q&A box option. Um, please do send your questions through there. Um, I'll be asking the panelists questions as they come through. You can use the chat box as well for some general talk around what's going on. And you can also upvote questions. So if you see something that you really like, um, or that is similar to a question that, that you had, um, you, could, you can always upvote that rather than repeating the question. Um, and it also gives us this, a sense and a bit of a pulse as to what people are really interested in around this discussion of community and mental health. Um, all right, I think we will um, get cracking into this. It's been a wonderful journey for me. My job as a storyteller and so um, I've just learned so much about this, this topic of regenerative agriculture in the last um, few months that we've been doing this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the experts tell you what they know this evening. Um, so I think without further ado, we will ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, would love to start with you, Jules, over to you. Certainly. <laughs> Thank you, Elena, very much for all you've been providing. It's been really wonderful listening and watching those other um, podcasts and, that you've done. So, 
to introduce myself, I think first and foremost, I think of myself as a farmer. Um, farming's been a big part of my life, both in New Zealand and, in, and abroad. And I spent probably just over 20 years farming in the States and in Canada. And I came to regenerative practices probably fairly, it was a fairly natural progression for me and partly through, I think, my own curiosity about farming systems and partly through living in other places where you're exposed to different ideas and different thinking. And then part of that, part of that process was for me in the 90s, um, being chosen to be one of a group of people in Washington State that were um, trained in holistic management through the university and the Savory Institute. So that was a big part of opening up my mind to different ways of thinking. And then more significantly, I think, was through a personal interaction. And it was on my return to New Zealand and I worked with this lovely chap called Quentin. And one day Quentin said to me, he said, oh, Jules, you're, you're, just, you're amazing, you're, you're, you're incredible. And I smiled sweetly and thanked him. And he took a rather big breath and looked me in the eye and he said, but, uh, you know, you're going through life being a bitch. Excuse my language. But it was in that moment of real directness that I took a big breath and he smiled and he said, you don't get who you are in the world. And people don't get to really experience who you are. And he suggested I go off and do a course. So off I went to do this course. and. That took my life on another turn, which was eight or 10 years of working with people in the well, realm of personal performance and ontological coaching. So coaching people in their state of being for the sake of producing results in life and, and really getting to a state of fulfillment. So that was an interesting journey. And from that, I, come, I came around sort of full circle and met Nicole and, um, and have since been back in the realm of farming and working as, a, and I also work as a coach with Integrity Soils. So both as a facilitator and as a one-on-one -on -one coach with farmers as they make this journey into a transition. You know, transition. Um, and I think the, the thing that stands out a lot for me is that you, for people making that mindset shift, which is what regenerative is a lot about, you can't do that without having a corresponding emotional shift. So, yeah, that's that's where I come from. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jules. Um, and Nicole, who you mentioned, is uh, Nicole Masters, who has also been uh, a very much part of this series and will be featuring on our episode next week um, on lessons from around the world. Um, over to you, Jono. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm John O'Fru. I, yeah, I guess a little bit about my background. Um, I started farming when I was 11 years old. I grew up in a family of um, sheep dipping contractors and chemical applicators. That's what my stepfather did and my grandfather did. And so chemicals were just a normal part of my life. Um, you know, I got used to putting clothes in the washing machine and they'd come out smelling like the old man's overalls and it just didn't mean anything to me. It was just normal. And then I started farming when I was 11, started dairy farming, um, working every weekend and through the school holidays. And that really kicked off my interest in farming and just um, the excitement behind, um, yeah, bringing together, you know, sort of going through school without having access to um, being a farmer and understanding what that was and then understanding and after my introduction that it was, you know, I get to be a mechanic and a plumber and an electrician, probably shouldn't mention the electrician part, but, um, you know, I get to do all these things and, um, and it just, just took me out. I just really, really loved it. And so that started my progression in the dairy industry um, and later in the arable industry and, and, and later specializing in, in chemical application and agronomy. But it was really one moment that, um, when I first started farming, I was I was earning $130 a fortnight um, as as my first full time job, and um, at the time it was just the most fulfilling, amazing. You know, I got to go fishing after work on the banks of the Waitaki River. I got you know, to me it was a dream. And then one day I had a friend come to me whose father's farm I worked on, 
was one of my best friends, Pim, and um, still is to this day one of my good friends. He came to me and said that um, everyone at the school that, that I'd left, that he was still at, um, was taking the mickey out of me saying that Jono's only ever going to be a, a stinking dairy farmer and he's earning less than a dollar an hour. And in that moment of, of I guess, upset, I felt like I had to prove myself to the world all of a sudden. I went from being real, being like really driven, really distracted and really disconnected. I became this guy that you could never sit down with and, and, and be with because I was too busy being busy. Um, and, you know, I had kids through this and got married and my marriage uh, didn't last all that long. Um, I was with my ex-partner for 11 years and um, really just burnt out my relationship through trying to win this game called farming to prove, you know, subconsciously prove um, all these people wrong that I'd, that I'd been upset with for a long time um, just because of a conversation I had as a 15-year-old boy. And it wasn't until I realised this and through a few other profound uh, opportunities, like going from managing a chemical application company here in, in Canterbury and being known as the town or the local sort of expert in the chemical space, to being asked to manage a, a large uh, organic uh, mixed cropping sheep and beef farm, which really challenged my thinking. And um, through that introduction and that opportunity, um, and then through the grief moments of um, my wife and children moving away and and through um, those discoveries I made not only about myself but also about the world around me and, and the ecological world and the biological world I was just fascinated by what I was discovering and how it affected really every part of my life um, when I was farming and trying to win that game um, I was so stressed I didn't know it because I thought that that was the, the way that we had to be as, as, as industry professionals. I thought that as a farmer, I had to just work all the time um, to, the fact, to the point where, you know, I'd come home at night and I just was not present with my family. Um, and, and I always felt like I'd never done enough. You know, I didn't deserve to sit down. I didn't deserve to you know, even, even sleep well at night. Like I used to, um, smoke cannabis to sleep at night because my brain wouldn't stop and then in discovering um, all this stuff about ecosystem function and diversity and self-expression um, through my journey of, of understanding I was just lit up by what I discovered to be um, the term we now use as regenerative agriculture so I now I've started a company uh, Natural Performance Limited where I go out and coach people um, how to take these ecological principles and the vast forms of them and put them into a practical application um, that's relevant to the people and what they're dealing with, you know, of which there's just huge variety. And um, I'm really excited about being here. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that story uh, with us, Jono. I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to dive into um, some more of that um, throughout the hour. I um, want to hand it over to Sam introduce yourself thanks kia ora Alina um, and yeah thanks for having us here and it's nice to be on a webinar with a couple of good friends um, yeah my uh, I've got a again quite a quite a different story I guess I actually grew up in Lower Hutt um, my mum was a farm girl married a city boy um, and so that was kind of my upbringing um, and split split sort of yeah, growing up in town there and spending a lot of time with my grandparents and cousins up in, up in Hawke's Bay on hill country farms up there. And uh, it was actually, I was, I was just thinking about the question, it was probably my high school geography teacher that actually uh, helped me realise, oh, there's probably a few people like that, um, that kind of where I started to really develop this interest in the uh, kind of with land and people and how they interacted. Um, and that was I suppose I had, a, I had a connection to Hill Country Hawke's Bay that I always really missed when I was away. Um, and anyway, that evolved into um, some time at university and uh, a little bit of time in government, uh, working in ways that I didn't really enjoy, to be honest. Uh, and I eventually sort of dropped that um, pathway and went shepherding uh, with my uncle up in Hawke's Bay on the, on the farm that my grandparents used to run. Um, and yeah, the... That was a kind of um, what you'd call a conventional um, lamb and bull beef finishing 
farm there. Um, still is. Amazing place. I had an absolute blast for uh, a year and a bit there. Um, just working with my uncle, who's not too much older than me. Um, but um, I suppose there was... Yeah, I, I kind of always had this... Uh, yeah, be, being grounded at the farm level by itself wasn't quite enough. So I ended up doing a little bit of rural leadership stuff and eventually got asked to do a Nuffield scholarship, uh, which is an amazing opportunity. Um, and I was very fortunate uh, to have that. And my question was really, uh, for, for Nuffield, you've got to do a, uh, a project or have a topic of sorts um, that you kind of travel around the world exploring. Um, and mine was how do we support communities to to make systems shift, basically. Um, I, I didn't see hill country farming as we knew it um, continuing on the same trajectory that it was um, from, from, from where I was. And I was really curious about how we actually have a really healthy, uh, a healthy shift because all of these stories about how the, you know, the 1980s um, crash and uh, the loss of subsidies and that kind of stuff and all the hardship at that time and uh, that was sort of the most recent example I could find of uh, a massive shift in farm systems and communities um, and yeah on that um, that was kind of where I, I, was, I was looking at searching for communities that had made or farmers that had made shifts towards a more sustainable farm system of some sort and I didn't have any kind of prescription or definition of what that was it was just you're kind of looking for an, sort of an essence or a flavor of what that was and you get a bit of an instinct for it. Um, and that was a huge nine months of just um, intense learning with over 100 farmers in 19 countries, I think, um, was, was the, the tally there. And I just picked up some really uh, consistent themes and yeah, one of them, the, the one that possibly struck home the strongest was the, the importance of community support when you're going through changes like this. And that's really uh, driven a lot of what I've um, done since. The other, the other part of that was um, what we're talking about here is regenerative agriculture or regenerative farming and it goes by a lot of names and labels um, around the world but that kind of, you know, the power of biology and ecology um, in, in the hands of a farmer who understands those concepts and functions um, was achieving some pretty inspiring things uh, around the world. So, um, yeah, and it was interesting, the, uh, Duncan, one of the guys in Quorum Sense, um, posted this morning and said he'd found a video of my presentation from that scholarship this morning, which I've avoided watching for obvious reasons. And um, anyway, I, you know, I, I ended up watching it just out of curiosity. And it was fascinating because all the things I was going on about that I was, I was hoping that we would kind of get into as a country in terms of, uh, you know, exploring these uh, the, the kind of the biology and the ecology of our farm systems and developing that understanding and work in the kind of community driven nature by which, you know, which is what I'd seen succeed around the world. You know, that was, you know, black and white, what I was pretty keen to sink my teeth into. And it must have only been a couple of months later that uh, John O'Fru and Simon Osborne and Nigel Greenwood got together in a farm shed and started Quorum Sense, which is uh, about half of what I do now. So um, that, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool looking back. That was only a couple of years ago. Um, so I suppose I see myself part, part farmer, um, part sort of community supporter of sorts uh, in relation to Quorum Sense. And I also do a bit of independent research, uh, mostly with Dr. Gwen Grellett from Manaki Whenua, who was on here last week. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, that must have been such an incredible experience talking to so many farmers across the space of nine months. I'm sure we'll get to dive into that a little bit too. Uh, just a reminder to everybody on the call that you can submit questions through that Q&A box. Um, so feel free to chuck whatever's on your mind into there. Um, first up, I'd just like to ask all the panelists um, the question, and we're doing this question with all our webinars. Um, that's the very, uh, it seems like a simple question, but there's so many different answers to it. What does regenerative agriculture mean to you? Um, so Sam, perhaps you want to start off. Cool, thanks. Um, I, was, I was regretting this a little bit because I've been on the other side of webinars recently asking other people questions like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose the... I haven't really thought too hard about that particular question, to be honest. I mean, there's the, there's the principles um, of regenerative agriculture, which it sounds like most people are, are broadly familiar with, you know, how do we uh, 
how do we apply kind of human-based thinking to understanding how ecosystems and biology functions and how do we develop a farm system and uh, that, that, that works with that uh, and not against it. That's, you know, there's one level there. Uh, there's, there's the other level, which is kind of the, what are the outcomes that you're working towards? Um, what, you know, what are your goals for, for you and your farm and your, you know, in your community? Um, and what I really like about the uh, regenerative kind of narrative or community or whatever you want to call it, um, is it's really broad, you know, that stretching from, you know, your water and your biodiversity and your climate goals through to your um, community vitality and um, community support and that through to local food resilience, nutrient density, connecting, you know, the health of our soils to the health of our food and the health of our people. And um, the, the kind of rigor that the conversation brings to paying attention to all of those things and not focusing too much on anyone. Um, I, I really, really, really like. So that's at one level, that's kind of what it means to me. Um, and at another level, it's just about communities of farmers and, and people that support them, you know, creatively looking to continuously improve uh, what they're working towards and, you know, using some pretty exciting new understandings and tools, or perhaps not new for some people, uh, but new for many in terms of, you know, the power of diversity and microbiology and um, ecological systems uh, when we work with them. So, yeah, that's, um, I'll, I'll perhaps I'll leave it there and um, bow to the wisdom of Jules and Jono for some more articulate <laughs> definitions. Jono, would you like to jump in there? Yep, sure. So what is regenerative agriculture to me? So regenerative agriculture to me, and again, broadly stated, because it is such a huge thing, um, is that it's about understanding the impacts of each of your choices that you make um, with the basis of um, utilising the natural resources and the natural capital that we all have access to. And, um, you know, we, we can create systems around these, but the cool thing with regenerative is, is that you're never, uh, you're never finished. You're never actually fully regenerative. Regenerative is, to me, is more of a context. And, and we're learning stuff all the time. And, and the really cool thing about regenerative agriculture, to me, is that, that community sharing of knowledge and ideas. And that's why we started Quorum Sense and how it's been so effective is that, you know, no longer is it, is it sort of us versus them. It's sort of like we're all going to make this and we're all learning together and we're especially not all collectively failing. But it's about understanding, you know, like Sam said, that the, the basic fundamentals of biology and ecosystem function, you know, really of which, if I'm bold enough to say, is that we really just are scratching the surface. Um, nature is so complex. You know, I, I said something in a previous interview and it's now on the homepage of my website. It's like going from complicated simplicity to simple complexity. Yes, natural cycles and ecosystem function is hugely complex. You know, everything we do is... Is, has, a, has a ripple effect, a lot of which we don't actually understand, nor do we see. But it's about taking what we do understand and working with that to create food production systems and communities that allow everyone to flourish. No, I'm not just talking about human beings. You know, no longer are we the, the controllers. You know, we're just really at the, at the helm, so to speak. You know, the, the rudders being the ecosystem and we're just at the helm controlling what we can control, but really the work's being done by the rudder that being the, the biology and the ecosystem itself. So once we realize that, you know, we are not the ones on top, we're just part of everything. And then how do we go forward with that in mind with nature? Fantastic, thank you. Um, Jules, what does it mean to you, regenerative agriculture? Um, well, and again, it, it means a number of things, but when I think about Regenerative, I'm a little bit like Jono, and actually I prefer the word regenerating because regenerative denotes that there's an end in mind and, and there isn't, we don't know, we don't know how far, you know, we can go with much of what we're doing because we are just scratching the surface. But I think it's a, it, I think of it as a whole system approach to not only ecosystem, but also financial, personal, 
and community well-being and dynamics. So it's 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 based in it's principle based and and for us it's measured by outcomes. So there are no there are no constraints going into it. It's just a matter of measuring the results you're getting to see are you um, improving those um, bottom lines you're looking at or not. And and I think it also needs to be looked at in local context. So although the principles can be um, taken and, and applied everywhere, uh, applying them relative to the context is really uh, a vital piece of it. So I think fundamental to it is mindset. And what I see over and over and over again is, is a mindset oh, that includes curiosity. It seems to include a lot of accountability. Um, the people I see really who are adopting this are lifelong learners anyway. And there's a huge amount of collaboration. So I often say that that nature is a reflection of us and who we're being. And when you look at some of the troubles that we're facing in our natural ecosystems, we're also facing a lot of those issues in our bodies as well. Um, so I think as far as principles go, it's about maximizing photosynthesis so we can really enhance ecosystem function through sunlight, which is our in, it's the energy source of everything, and really promoting life. And that's promoting life on all levels, not just human life and human well-being. And of course, to do that, we need to really look at the fundamental, one of the fundamentals, which is diversity. So diversity in, in, in all the ecosystems. And out of that, building resilience. And, and I think we know when we're really re regenerative, when we've got a syntrophic system at work with that upward spiraling and that upward improvement and where that ends, who knows? I don't think there is, but you know, we've, we've been measuring things based on a system that's certainly not functioning optim optimally. So, it, you know, there's a lot of fun in discovering what there is to discover. Gotcha, yeah. And I'd like to actually, before we dive into the questions in the Q&A, uh, put that question to Jono. You've talked about um, uh, the, the shift in mindset for you and an, an improvement in your own mental health. So would love to just hear a little bit about what, what was it about regenerative agriculture that caused that shift for you? Yeah, cool. So um, there was a few, you know, there was several things, but the, some of the key parts were I guess going from, you know, when we're, when we're trying to control everything, you know, like my old life or my history has been to kill, whether it be competing, you know, competing plant species, um, you know, fungal attack, um, all these treatments of symptoms. And we treat those with, with, with huge, you know, velocity. Um, with agrochemicals and, and, and tillage and, and lots of different things to, and, and like doing that, there was like a, a level of subconscious resignation. Like as Jill said, you know, what we're dealing with out there is like really, really a correlate of what we're dealing with as, as human beings. And so while I was out there controlling the ecosystem, trying to get this, this target that we're promoted to get to by our industry, is that inside I was also suppressing my self-expression and um, I was scared to, to really express that. And, and I'm only just seeing these sort of correlations now um, in retrospect. At the time, it was just I was just a, a grumpy, arrogant, righteous man that knew better than everyone. And, um, and that brought on a lot of anger and, and I kept a lot of people, including my friends and family, you know, out here at arm's length, um, just to not challenge me and people that did challenge me, I tell you what, it wasn't pretty. And then all of a sudden, with the discovery of regenerative agriculture and community, and like Jill said, diversity across all spectrums, that includes uh, input and, and, and um, diversity of, of perspectives is just hugely vital. And when I started letting go of trying to control things, and actually being part of something and being open to learning all these different perspectives. That's, 
you know, people say to me, I was at Steve Ratton's um, up in the Burns building at Lincoln there a few weeks ago, and he, we're having a discussion about a few practical things around biology and ecosystem. And he said to me, what are your credentials? And I said, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, I never got NCA level one. I never went to university. And there was a silence for about 10 seconds. And he said, he smiled, he says, you're a scholar of life. And so the, the key thing here is, as Jill said, curiosity. Um, I got this sense of, of fulfillment and joy from being a contribution to the world. So taking my perspective and getting over the fear of sharing that, or like the fear of not being accepted for what I had to say and getting over the wanting to have the agreement all the time, because that's really when you get down underneath it, it seems to be we're all after that agreement and it's no wonder we stay the same. It's like once you get beyond that um, and embrace the diversity that we all are, that's how we progress. So I got to start being a contribution. I got to start learning from all these wonderful people, you know, a lot of people on this call, I've got, you know, Nicole Masters to thank immensely for in the early days when I started to discover all the stuff and we just started Quorum Sense and, you know, Quorum Sense, although now it's a charitable trust at the time, it was just a group where we'd just hang out around farms and talk stuff. Um, it, it, I, I got to this point where I was like, you know, I'd, for no, no longer was I going for the farm ownership thing with the family because I didn't have the family anymore. I was left with, right, what am I going to do? And I knew contributing felt really good. I knew giving felt really good. Like in, in any ecosystem or farm system, it is all a currency. You cannot receive without giving. And so when I was faced with, what am I going to do here? Um, for everyone's information, I, I, I did stop smoking cannabis. And, uh, and I, I actually had my heart rate drop significantly, like 15 beats per minute on average. Um, I started to become present with people for the first time, seeing people for who they really were, not as the judgment I thought they were in my yucky head of righteousness and, and arrogance. Let go of all that and wow, I just got to be with people. Um, I was having a conversation with Nicole one day, a, a, a private conversation about, I was thinking about going out and starting, you know, um, sharing my perspective as a, as a job, you know, as, as a full-time thing. And, and I'm entertaining these thoughts like I'm not ready and I'm not good enough. You know, those thoughts that we most, most of us hold on to before we take action. And a lot of us won't take action because of those. And thank, thank goodness for Nicole, because she was like to me, she was like, Jono, you're ready now. And she's like, the world needs you now. And I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> and so I just went out and just started doing stuff and one foot in front of the other. And again, just being open to all the things that life throws at you and, and now, you know, I, I sleep well at night and, and um, I have this level of contentment that I've never experienced before. And I tell you what, I'm more busy than I ever have been, you know. I used to do 100 hour weeks and complain about how busy I was. Now I do more than that. But I tell you what, there's no complaints at my end. Mm, that's fantastic to hear. Again, thank you for sharing that, that part of your personal story. Um, I love that, um, that idea of being a scholar and, and of life. And there's a comment and a question here from Caroline Stewart, um, who said she learned more about, um, I guess, regenerative agriculture, um, that approach from transforming her own small vegetable garden patch than she did in a four year forestry degree. So there's a question of, of how, how is regenerative agriculture reaching out to gardeners and, and sharing what they're learning and how is um, the, the community, I guess, amplifying what's going on? Are you asking me that question, Alina? Um, if you'd like to answer, that's fine, but it'd be, it'd be great to hear from any of the others as well. Um, Jules, I know you, you travel around the country a fair bit, um, so you've probably seen a lot, um, a lot of different case examples. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think as the whole concept of regenerative or regenerating is, is taking hold, not only are farmers interested, but certainly a lot of gardeners and, and Integrity Soils, we've had lots of conversations around this and currently I've been doing a little bit of work with various groups at looking at, you know, how do you roll these concepts out so that, that they're easily available to people and what are the concepts, what are the things that people need to know so that they can go about growing really healthy food for themselves? I mean, I, I would like to see I would like to see more availability of information and certainly 
um, maybe some sort of guiding principles, whether that's on some webinars or you know, however, whatever form that takes. I mean, personally, if I had the, the time and the, and the ability, I'd go around this country doing workshops for gardeners because right. when you look at, at, at like the Second World War, you know, 50% of or 40% of the food in America was grown in home gardens. And, you know, we only need to look at what happened with COVID and, and you know, there were no seedlings left. And I can guarantee you a lot of those seedlings probably didn't do very well. Um, and it would be it would be lovely to have a nation of people who were really au fait with how do you grow great nutritious food, and out of that how do we have um, a great ecosystem that's really healthy. And also, you know, we're raising children with smart minds because they're getting good nutrients. So, yeah, quite how to do it, I'm not sure, but you know, I currently have have the role of managing a wee farm out of Wellington, and that's one of the things we're intending to do here is have it as a an educational place for for urban people. Absolutely, so. I could tell you my veggie garden is full of the plants that I uh, that I planted in seedling pots the, the weekend before lockdown. I'm I'm pretty stoked that I that I took the effort to do that. Um, I mean, it, it really also um, as I could I can see that it provides. Um, those urban New Zealanders with a way to think about regenerative agriculture and think about what's going on in the soil. So there's a great question here from Blaise Turnbull around how do you think we can better facilitate cross-community conversations between rural and New Zealand communities? Um, Sam, any thoughts on that one or any of the others? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, quite simply, you know, the, the, food, the, the food is the connection between um, yeah, as, as, a, as a primary conduit between rural and urban, um, I guess, and the, it's been amazing the conversations that have been sparked, you know, with with the whole COVID thing in terms of people that have been thinking about, you know, local supply, um, you know, or farmers thinking about local supply of food to to their local communities, or people in town thinking about, you know, trying to find direct source food from their farming community, but no one, you know, never quite getting to that point, and then all of a sudden, COVID happens, and the incentives there that you've got the time, and then everybody's talking about it and there's a whole lot of amazing conversations that have sparked um coming out of that so i think the food conversations yeah just uh really really fits that and there's um you know it's not a it's not necessarily a, an easy an easy fix in terms of that um you know some of the supply chain kind of stuff there's a there are some things that sit slightly outside of a farmer's core skill set or their core knowledge that require you know, different expertise and different skills and different perspectives to come in and help set those things up. Uh, and yeah, you know, I suppose what I'm really enjoying about the sort of regenerative farming community in New Zealand at the moment is again the diversity thing. Is there's so many people that are just sort of listening in and um, and, and contributing in their own ways with all of these really kind of very different skill sets to to what a, a lot of farmers have. And um, I'm quite excited about where that's where that's going to go. Um, and just on the on the previous question in terms of um, you know regenerative urban gardening or whatever uh, we our lawn got a bit destroyed just before covid so I stole a whole lot of cover crop seed and we took every type of veggie seed that we possibly could and we just sprinkled it out on the lawn with a bit of turf grass and to be honest that's what kept me sane all for the eight weeks in covid because I got to watch this amazing diversity and you're like what's going to come up now and what's not going to come up and just having that sitting out your front door was amazing. We thought all the kale and um, and kale and broccoli had failed, but you know, six eight weeks after we'd seeded it, you know, a, a little rain event comes along and suddenly it's just it's cranking through. So I encourage anyone to give something like that a crack and just have a bit of a play in your backyard and see what happens because it's it, it's amazing how much fun it is. It sounds like a fun experiment. Um, any of the other panelists want to answer that question around the the rural urban rural community? Uh, I don't want to say divide, but yeah, the making the connection? I think it's important to firstly acknowledge that there has become this divide. Um, you know, much like when I started school in, in town, when I say town, I, I was brought up and done train up the Waitaki Valley and then went to school in Omaru. And um, the shift in from being out in the country and being accepted to all of a sudden going to town and I was like alienated because of my interest in farming. Um, that first had me aware of the fact that there was a divide and now you know like sam said the, the common thing is that we all essentially we all need food and um 
and and what that looks like is you know really we all need to be on the same wavelength and because the diversity thing you know why it's so important is we get to have outcomes that weren't possible without it and so there's a lot of things that even people in the urban settings can contribute at a scale um that that might not be being thought of um and and vice versa like back to the gardening thing my grandmother and my grandfather have been on a quarter acre section for you know 40 years and they've been growing vegetables there really well when i say really well they've always had vegetables and when i used to walk into the garden shed it just stank of chemicals and fertilizers but you know they always had vegetables and they were always really tasty and then it wasn't until last year um after having started um symbiosis with peter barrett we were doing cover crop mixes i had a bit of leftover seed and sam i'm watching you buddy i'm gonna have to start hiding my little stashes of seed and um, anyway my my grandmother she used to um cover her gardens pre-spuds with um she used to grow mustard and then hoe that in and then cover the the soil with toilet pa uh, not toilet paper newspaper and um and then i talked to her about the power of diversity and i had this this you know handful of cover crop seeds and we put it down and it grew and she rang me out she's like son what is this you know we, it's going crazy out here do we need to be you know spraying the stuff and returning it back into the soil i said no no just let it do its thing that year after 40 years of growing spuds she had the biggest yield she ever had just by having diversity in pre the spuds and she said they tasted better they stored better and she was just blown away and she was a good gardener got it okay can i add something quickly to that sure i i just think you've both touched on what's really important and and there's one more thing which is we don't have a lack of science and a lack of knowledge we actually have a lack of understanding and that goes for both urban and rural people and and i think the more we can learn the more we can expand our understanding of ecosystem function whether that be you know your little square plot in, in, in an urban setting or whether that be you know thousands of hectares of farmland it's no different so i think it's really important that we all take that on yeah i think that's a really important distinction between knowledge and understanding and if you're if you're someone who's new quite new to those kind of conversations perhaps, uh, that perhaps might come across as a bit a bit woo woo or philosophical so um, there's a fantastic and really i think important question from Michael Riley here um, around um, how farmers who want to make the transition can deal with those those social pressures from family and friends the wider community and and as he says it pushy sales reps um, noting that the ridicule can be really intense um, and of course these are tight-knit social communities that we're talking about so um, how do you how do you deal with that dynamic Um, I'll, I'll jump on that one. So, and I've worked with Michael Riley, he's a fantastic human being, um, and I know he dealt with this hard in the early stages for being not accepted by his peers, not, not the way, you know, we hope to be. And this is the thing is, what we've got to remember is, you know, the, the pushback and the, the, the ridicule, um, what we've got to remember is that's nothing to do with us. And that's where it's really important that you develop that context for yourself or that intention of what you're at to achieve. And then just remembering that other people may not carry that same view. And when you're in a, in a, in a reductionist mechanical mindset of food production, where we're talking monocultures, controlling diversity, you know, removal rates of nutrients and replenishment, what we're talking about here, as far as biological function and, and, and you know, speaking to that one specifically, like mineral provision, is it does seem really eerie theory and really hard to grasp. And you just can't, you know, like if someone had said to me when I was a chemical applicator about, you know, free nutrients through through microbial diversity, I would have said, get out of town, you know. So it's about just getting for yourself clear your intention, what you're out to do. Um, surround yourself with the people who support that and who are open to that sort of mindset, and 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 don't you know to, to to feel you need to defend yourself to those people you know like what i invite you to do there guys and michael you know this is is just listen to the concerns of these people make sure that they're heard 
and there's all of a sudden no defense, you don't need to defend what you're doing, and then just share with them what you're up to and what you'd like to achieve. And th that's how we sort of get to encourage and, and lead rather than defend and stay stagnant. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, Sam, you'd, um, you'd mentioned that it was in the communities where there was a lot of support um, for the farmers that were making these sorts of transitions that seemed to be thriving. I wonder if you can speak a little to that. Yeah, well, that was um, the, I suppose, the, you know, what I kind of stumbled across was uh, farmers that had tried and kind of got knocked back and, and sort, of flipped, sort of sunk back to where they were and other farmers that had tried something and, you know, got through, got through that sort of tricky transition phase and thrived. And it was really, you know, um, that was really just the, the presence of a, a group of people or a community of people that believed in what they were doing. And they didn't actually have to be farmers themselves or have any kind of technical knowledge that could help farmers overcome the technical changes. It was actually simply the fact that, um, you know, whether it was family or friends or a, um, a local farming group or uh, an online community of some sort, if farmers felt like they were supported, um, then they were far more likely to to get through that phase. And I'd, I mean, Jono's advice there was um, fantastic. And there was, it's a, it's a, it is quite a sad story that, um, that and it's not uh, limited to New Zealand, that so many farmers that kind of try something different do get really scorned because of this sort of connection between how you farm and your identity and your community. And it's all tied up, which is, I mean, it's a, it's a weird human thing um, and it's extremely common. Um, and yeah, that's just the, if you, you know, if you, if you're making, I suppose that my practical advice is if you're, if you're making, if you're making a start um, and exploring this kind of thing, then make sure you do find yourself a, um, even if it's just a small community, you know, small group of people that you can bounce ideas off and just talk about what you're doing, who can, you know, when things don't go to plan or you make a mistake or whatever, you know, they're there to just, you know, to, to help you through it. Um, and that's just super important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jules, I know you've um, worked with a lot of different communities around the country. So are there any standout examples that you, that you can share of, of where this has um, worked well, that, that power of, um, I guess, social cohesion and getting the message out there? Well, I think both these guys have covered it pretty well. And, you know, the best demonstration we have in this country is actually Quorum Sense. And how do you, you know, collaborate as a group of people and take out of the space any wrong making. You know, we, we've, we've developed a society that's all about knowing the answer. And, you know, our importance and our worth is all based around what we know. And, and I think in this regener regenerative space, it's really about being brave to ask the questions and being brave enough to say, you know, I have no idea. And, and, look to others to help guide you and and it is it's about collaboration and it's about supporting one another and i think i was just having a conversation this evening before this and and it was about a, a, a family that have sort of taken on a bit of a regenerative approach and dad got really nervous and threw out a lot of nitrogen three times in a row unbeknownst to his son and caused you know some quite serious problems with cattle and 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 I think we've got to look beyond what the issues are and look at what are our interests and come together in that real collaborative way around our interests because there are always going to be issues and there are always going to be issues we have differing opinions on. But that's not where we're going to really be collaborating. So I think, you know, look beyond that and find out what people are interested in and be brave enough to, you know, forget the tall poppy thing and actually share because it's one of the things New Zealanders, you know, are not so good at is we're not so good at sharing ourselves and sharing our vulnerability and our concerns. And I think when we do and, and others are willing to just hear us, they don't have to fix our problems. They just have to listen and listen with a bit of an open heart really helps. Mm, I think you're dead right there. And that's, that's where I see stories like Jono's being so powerful in terms of other people being able to see themselves and, and know that people are out there talking about it and that there are, are different ways to be farming. Um, I actually want to jump to a question now that's come through on the Facebook um, live stream because we're, we're simultaneously live streaming there. Um, 
I mean, uh, one thing that I've, uh, that's come up a few times as I've been researching this series is there's a lot of overlaps between regenerative agriculture and, um, and indigenous worldviews and relating to the land. Um, so there's a question around how, how are you working with te ao, te ao Māori on your farms and developing your understanding of te tiriti when it comes to the whenua and what it means to you as, as Pākehā? So does anybody like to answer that one? I would love to, Alina. Um, so to give you an understanding, I, so me and my twin sister were the first sort of Pākehā generation of our family and my grandmother taught te reo at all of the schools in the Waitaki Valley and around Omaru um, voluntary for a few decades. And um, I actually grew up resenting my heritage and, and because of the, what I, the area that I grew up in didn't allow for that, that culture, that it was like the stereotypical sort of high country, um, you know, sheep and beef sort of environment where there was this view about the Māori people that um, I was nervous to acknowledge that I was part of. And when I realized in recent years, the impact that that's had on me and suppressing that and started to embrace it, um, I've, I've since now felt this connection and, and like I, I've now learned like my mihi, for instance, and I'm learning a few things around my, my history. And I'm, I'm looking at, um, I, I have actually been uh, coaching a few um, people in, involved in, in a few iwi up north. And for the first time in my life, I'm like, so excited about about coming back to my heritage and bringing that forward and, and my children are too which is really exciting mm. it's great to hear that you're on that learning journey um either of our other panelists like to speak to that at all yeah i, I guess the um the, the the point to where it's got um for me personally is with you know there's a uh have got some amazing Maori practitioners that are that are really good friends with been having lots of conversations about the you know the real natural synergy between te ao Māori and kind of the regenerative way of thinking uh, in terms of living systems and, and things like that but really it's um, at this stage to, to be honest it's kind of been conversations um, there's we've had some really amazing conversations with um, Māori landowners uh, and there's a few there's quite a lot of them going around the country I think the fastest the perhaps the fastest kind of um, segment of people um if you, to put it that way that are that are really kind of grasp that just naturally grasp uh what we're doing but that's gonna i think it's gonna express itself in a, in a in its in its own way um and that's sort of what i'm observing a little bit at the moment but um i mean we'd love i'd love just to see more of um the richness of kind of uh, multi culture starting to weave through um the work that we're doing and that so looking forward to it yeah thanks sam um, we've got about five minutes left in our conversation here this evening. Did you want to add anything um, on, on that topic, Jules? Before? I think just briefly, I think, you know, we all come from different walks of life and, and different levels of understanding in different contexts. And, you know, we've lived in a predominantly white Western context. And I think it's up to all of us, you know, the onus is on us to really listen with the intention of understanding in a way that we never have so that we can really embrace the richness and the fullness of this nation and what was here before us. I think that's vital. Very well said. Thank you, Jules. Um, there's a question from Thomas that I'd like to put to you. And I know that this is one that is um, front of mind for a lot of farmers that are thinking about transitioning. Um, but um, how have the panelists interacted with communities who have fears or anxieties about the output levels per hectare um, if they apply regenerative approaches to their farming? It could be a big scary thing, right, to, to change everything that you think you knew um, and try this experiment on your land when your livelihood is at stake. So um, what would you do to allay those fears? Um, if I can jump in there, I think, I think firstly, you know, people need to develop a little bit of confidence in anything new they're doing. So I think there's nothing wrong with taking these principles and applying them on a small portion of your farm. So you can actually really start to see what works in my location, given my financial situation, my constraints and opportunities in my land base, 
and also with regards to my family and my community. So I think, you know, when people have a really clear path forward, they can juggle those things in a way that, that, that empowers them. And, you know, get yourself a good mentor, whether that's someone in your location or someone in a different location that you can bounce stuff off of. You know, it might be another farmer, it might be someone who's working in the industry. And, and search out those opportunities like Calm the Farm and what's coming through that where, you know, people are starting to get connected. Yeah, wonderful. And I guess that's where um, communities like Quorum Sense are so important. I wonder if um, one of you, Sam or, or Jono, could just speak to the kind of, um, the kind of support that, that farmers on the Quorum Sense group are, are um, providing to one another? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Just um, got voluntold. <laughs> I was pointed. Um, so, so what we do in Quorum Sense is it's really just about sharing our experiences, not from a place of like my way's better or you need to do what I what I do. It's more just like here's what I do. Um, we all share not just the good, but also the not so good. Um, and it's about you know, like Jules said it earlier, just about people's um, concerns being heard. And then you get this diversity of, well, actually, I've been in a similar situation to that, and this is how I overcame it. Or, you know, a lot of the time, what people see is something wrong. And, and again, back to Jules, you know, we've got to stop doing that, is because a lot of the time when you get out there and discuss these things and express what you're dealing with, often it's actually, there's nothing wrong. Often there's no failure. It's just your, your perspective of what's going on. And, and, sharing that and not getting stuck in the <gasps> of I'm doing something bad or wrong allows us to be fluent and adaptable and resilient to these things that we used to see as issues. Mm. And again, just being a contribution, like in a quorum sense, everyone's contributing and it's just this, you know, this energy and, and you just can't, I've never exper experienced anything like it. And people are getting their expression. People are getting you know, to be a contribution, people are getting to learn, you know, so much just from all this diversity. And that's what Quorum Sense was started for. Yeah. And just, just, just to add to that, I suppose that, you know, at the, at the moment, a lot of Quorum Sense is, is online. Um, you know, mostly the Facebook page is what most people connect to. But um, our, our goals as a group are very much to get, um, kind of tie back into a little bit of how Quorum Sense started in terms of back in the field and r running events and that person to person stuff, but also just trying to create multiple forms of um, engagement for, for everyone. So um, there's kind of what Quorum Sense is now and kind of where we're hoping to head. So um, yeah, we're that one. And we've got a link to the Quorum Sense Facebook group um, in the chat window if you want to check that out. Um, we have reached the top of the hour now, so I think we're, um, we're going to draw it uh, there. We've got a few more um, questions in the chat window. Um, so we might look at seeing if we can address some of those on social media, perhaps um, this week on the Pure Advantage Facebook page. Um, you can follow them on Facebook or on Instagram. Check out Quorum Sense as well. Um, very cool, active community. Um, the Edmontary Fellowship is also on Facebook. Um, also Twitter, I think both. And um, EHF also has a really active YouTube channel as well where you can see all of the uh, previous recordings of this webinar series, as well as a bunch of other uh, webinars and uh, videos from that community of, of global thinkers, not just on Region Ag, but on a lot of different things. Um, you can also catch the recordings of these webinars on the Pure Advantage website as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Next week, we have a lunchtime session again. So we're alternating between evenings and lunch times to try and uh, accommodate both speakers in the US and also, of course, farmers who are out there doing it during the day. Um, so next week, we've got lessons from around the world. Uh, we've got a, a packed panel next week with four uh, amazing speakers. Uh, we have got Erin Crampton, who has grown up in the Canadian prairies in Manitoba. So she'll be speaking a little bit about her experience. Um, Sam will be joining us again next week and we can dive a little more into his um, journeys around communities around the world. Nicole Masters, who we discussed earlier, um, who's now based in the US and also based in the US is Selene Diaris, um, who's a bit of a community weaver over there and um, is a real connector between the different aspects of regenerative agriculture. 
So thank you so much for joining us all this evening. It's been a fantastic conversation and thank you again to our uh, speakers for being so gracious um, with your time and so generous um, and wonderful to have you all here tonight. Um, thank you. We'll see you next week.